I love to sing praises to my Savior, worship and adore. I love to tell how he saved my soul and magnify my Lord. I love to thank him for his faithfulness, the cross and why he came. I love to pray in Jesus, Jesus' name. There's nothing sweeter than to live each day walking with my Lord, to go to him in prayer and open up his word. He is the Son of God, exalted high, no other is the same. That's why I pray in Jesus' name. I love to go to church with others in the family of God. Join my sisters and brothers praising God above. I love to hear Bible preaching, the Word of God proclaim. Then someone pray in Jesus, Jesus' name. There's nothing sweeter than to live each day walking with my Lord. To go to Him in prayer and open up His Word. He is the Son of God, exalted high, no other is the same. That's why I pray in Jesus' name. His name is Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty Prince of Peace. When troubles come, He's the one who commands the storms to cease. He's the rock of my salvation, forever He shall reign. There's saving power in Jesus, Jesus' name. There's nothing sweeter than to live each day walking with my Lord, to go to Him in prayer and open up His Word. He is the Son of God, exalted high, no other is the same. That's why I pray in Jesus' name. There's nothing sweeter than to live each day walking with my Lord. To go to Him in prayer and open up His Word. He is the Son of God, exalted high, no other is the same. That's why I pray in Jesus' name. There's hope and healing, there's strength and comfort. There's grace and mercy in Jesus, Jesus' name. That's why I pray in Jesus' name, in Jesus' Thank you, Brother Bob. We're going to have some old-fashioned music next Sunday night, Brother Hightower. I want you to sing again next Sunday night, if you wouldn't mind. And uh, I'm looking forward to having a great time, and we're going to have some fun with some hot cider and some different things next Sunday night that are just kind of more uh, down home. And I hope you'll enjoy the service as we gather together. Next Sunday night, the world calls Halloween, and uh, we're going to call it church. And, uh, but we're going to have a little fun at church. I figured a long time ago, if I can't have fun at church, I can't have fun because this is where I spend my life. So we're going to have some fun next Sunday night as well. Well, never in human history have we needed discernment like we need discernment today. There have never been so many emotions, so many false doctrines, so many areas in which we must have God's mind and as we come to chapter 4 of 1 John, we now begin a section of this epistle that is giving us clear warning about the necessity of walking in the discernment 
of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, as early as Paul's first missionary journey, you'll find that the devil and his evil spirits were working to discredit the truth. In fact, if you want to go back to the very book of the Bible, first book of the Bible, you'll find that Satan was questioning the word of God even there. It has been the work of Satan and his evil spirits to question God's word from the beginning of time. But as the church was beginning to expand, there were many false spirits, many false doctrines that began to rise. In fact, the church has never had a time where there was not some false teaching, where there were not some false teachers coming against God's revelation of Jesus Christ himself. And so the apostles warned and warned and called for discernment in these areas. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, it is told to the Ephesian pastors, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. This was the warning of the Apostle Paul concerning the false teaching that would come up even from within the ranks at Ephesus. Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, spoke about those who would privily bring damnable heresies into the church, that these spirits uh, that were of satanic origin would bring about teachings that were uh, directly opposed to the teachings of the apostles regarding Jesus Christ. Jude, of course, the entire book of Jude. But in verse number four, the Bible says, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men. And these men that crept in unawares were false teachers guided by evil spirits uh, taking aim at the doctrines of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul and Peter and Jude and then the Apostle John tonight here in our text, Beloved, Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they be of God. Tonight we are challenged by the apostles, specifically by John, that we are not to be gullible Christians, that we are not to fall for everything under the name of religion or spirituality, that we are to test and we are to try the false teachers and the false spirits that would come our way. I want you to notice in our text tonight, first of all, that there must be a determination to test. There must be a determination on the part of a mature believer to test the spirits, to test the teachings of the spiritual world by the test of the Holy Spirit and by the test of the doctrine of the deity of Jesus Christ. Here we are told, believe not every spirit, but try, or we could say, test the spirits to see whether they be of God. Now this determination to test then is to remind us that we must beware of ignorance. Now friend, I don't want to sound critical tonight, but I want to be real with you about the fact that there are millions of people who call themselves Christians, and many of them we hope are truly Christians, but they are more of the cultural sort. They are more of the sensational sort. They are more of the feelings sort, the emotional sort of a Christian than they are a biblical-based Christian. There are many today uh, who are a part of Christendom, whether organizationally or spiritually, we do not know. But many times in Christianity today, we find that there is great ignorance concerning even basic doctrines of the Word of God. People will say to me, he's such a spiritual man. And the man they're pointing to believes that Jesus is one of the gods. Or they'll say, oh, well, that's a, a great religion. And the religion they're speaking about denies the deity of Jesus Christ. 
And so this verse 1 is a command for every believer not to simply believe in something that appears to be spiritual or that calls itself even spiritual. Uh, it is a verse that is addressed to us as believers, and John is warning the early church against spiritual gullibility. In fact, notice he says in this verse, believe not. In other words, uh, we need not place confidence in something that is false. Don't place confidence in something that has not been tested by the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Just because someone, for, for example, quotes a Bible verse does not mean that they are rightly dividing the Word of God. Many people quote a verse to sound uh, spiritual or to make some fleshly point, but it is not taken contextually. Now if you would for a moment turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4 as we consider this matter of testing. 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 rather, and verse number 1. 1 Timothy 4, 1 says this, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. And this verse always arrests my attention because I believe that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Amen? The, the entire Bible is a Spirit-given book, a God-breathed book. But in this verse it says, The Spirit speaketh expressly. It is a double emphasis that we see. What is it that the Holy Spirit wants you to see tonight? Notice what it says. That in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now I want you to understand then uh, that there is going to be a falling away, a departing from the faith, led by what is referred to here as seducing spirits, wandering, misleading, leading into error. That is the work of the false demonic spirits. And the Bible says that uh, we are to listen to the Spirit who speaks expressly concerning this pattern and concerning the doctrine of devils that will be purported by these imposters. Now this ignorance on the part of a believer is often due to Bible ignorance. It is due to the fact that they do not know the doctrines of the Word of God in order to be able to discern right from wrong, truth from error. And may I say that even in good fundamental churches, churches that have a sound, what we would call fundamental doctrinal statement, many times the members are not familiar with how to defend that faith from the Word of God. I enjoy teaching our new members a doctrinal statement, but beyond that, bringing doctrine out into every message, and beyond that, having conferences or seminars and classes where doctrine can be taught on Wednesday night. Many times in good churches, people grow up knowing a set of rules. They grow up knowing outward standards, but they do not know Bible doctrine. And I'm going to tell you something. You can know outward standards, how to look, how to behave, and all of the perception that one might try to give in order to please another. But you can know all of those rules and never know the truths of doctrinal nature that are necessary in the spiritual warfare that we're fighting. And that is a warfare where God's Word is being attacked by false teachers every single day of our lives. And so we're seeing here tonight that we are to beware of ignorance biblically. I think about a new pastor that was asked to teach a boys class in the Sunday school and uh, the other teacher was absent and so he decided that he would kind of test their biblical knowledge and he gathered with them and he said, uh, now, now boys, let me ask you this question. Who knocked down the walls of Jericho? How did those walls fall down? Well, all the boys begin to say, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And they all quickly began to deny having knocked down the walls of Jericho. And boy, the pastor was pretty frustrated at the next deacon's meeting. He, he went in and, and uh, uh, he said, you know, not one of the boys in that class knew who knocked down the walls of Jericho. And the entire group of deacons was very, very quiet and somber about the situation. Finally, one of the veteran deacons spoke up and he said, preacher, now this appears to be bothering you a lot. But I've known all those boys since they were born, and they're good boys. And if they say they didn't know, then I believe them. <laughs> Let's just take up some money out of the repair and maintenance fund and fix up those walls. <laughs> now, hopefully that's not the case in a real Bible-believing Baptist church tonight. But there is much to be said about this 
thought of bewaring biblical ignorance. God says that we're to beware of these things. But not only bewaring of biblical ignorance, and we'll see some of the specific doctrines in just a moment, but we must beware of false spirits because behind these false doctrines are evil spirits. Behind the doctrine that says Jesus and Satan are brothers, I believe is a satanic spirit. I believe that that false doctrine was begun by Satan-inspired teachers. How many of you believe that Satan hates the truth? And you understand tonight that uh, behind these uh, false teachings are many times evil spirits. So the Bible says, believe not every spirit, but try the spirit. Now this word, uh, dokimazo, is a word that means to test, to examine, or to prove. It is to scrutinize. Somewhat uh, implied here would be uh, in a forensic type of a sense. To take what a teacher is saying about the Bible or about Christ and then to analyze that in the light of Scripture as the Holy Spirit of God illuminates your understanding. By the way, there is no excuse for ignorance when we hold the Word of God in our hands. God has given us the answer. And we must beware of the doctrines of devils. We must beware of demonic deception. And there is much that is abounding today. I think of the entire charismatic movement known as the Word of Faith movement. It is a particular line of teaching that essentially holds God hostage by saying that if you have enough faith in faith, then God has to do what you're telling Him to do. It's called the Word of Faith movement, and nothing could be farther from the truth. They, they deny verses that command us to pray according to the will of God. And they somehow place themselves at the level of God, being able to hold God hostage until he does what he says. Can I remind you tonight that there is a God in heaven who is in charge? Man proposes, but God disposes. And yet, these false teachers claim uh, that if you have enough faith in faith, you can get what you want every time. And you know what that brings? It brings confusion and guilt and sorrow on the part of those who are trusting in these false teachers inspired by. Uh, these false spirits. And so we must beware of ignorance and we must beware of false spirits. And then thirdly, we must beware of false prophets. Now notice in verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. God is letting us know that there are many false teachers in this world. Turn, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. 2 Peter 2, 1. It says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction." And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. So these false teachers bring in damnable heresies, heresies and teachings that if one believes them, their soul will be damned to hell. They will not accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and many will follow their wicked ways, the Bible says. Now there are a few truths we find here in Second Peter. First, false teachers who bring damnable heresies can be believers who have been deceived in their own hearts and their own pride. Notice the phrase there, even denying the Lord that brought them. These are people that are purchased. Uh, they are people that have been placed into the family of God, but they come to a point where they have bought into some false thought and can even perpetrate and continue that false thought upon others. And so we see the need for each of us as believers to rightly divide the Word, to try the Spirit, to let the Scriptures be the commentary on the Scriptures, and to study before we embrace some particular teaching. And notice also in 2 Peter 2 and verse 2, many who follow these false teachers are corrupted by them because they speak evil about the truth. What does Isaiah tell us about this? Isaiah 5 and 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, and put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And so God commands us to test the spirits. 
and to try the spirits to see whether they be of God. And we can try the spirits according to the doctrines of the word. We can try them according to the wisdom imparted to us by the Holy Spirit of God. And we must be in this age in which we live determined to test. We must determine to test. As we hear religious or spiritual things, we must be mindful of the fact there are many false prophets, there is a coming antichrist, and we are commanded to test or to try the spirits to see whether they be of God. And this is the command that is given to us in verse number one. But there is more than just a determination to test. There is secondly, a discernment of truth that will come. You see, if you're determined in your life that you're not just simply going to believe everything that's religious or everything that's called a church, and you determine that you're going to test, and I'm saying some of you are involved in Bible studies at work, or you listen to some radio teachers and this type of thing, those activities may or may not be great. It just depends on the test that you put to it. You must be determined to test. Is this a biblical outlet of teaching? And as you're testing, Secondly, there will come a discernment of the truth. Notice verse 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Now, how do you know if a ministry or a teaching is of the Holy Spirit of God? And I'm telling you, the most significant test of any religious group is always going to come down primarily to this question, what do they believe about Jesus Christ? Where do they stand on the work and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ? Now in verse two it says, hereby know ye. Here is how you know. Here is how you know if something or someone is by the Holy Spirit of God. And it says, every spirit that confesseth, that is, to say the same thing, that is, to be in agreement. Well, what are they agreeing upon? Well, it says in verse 2 that every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. The statement is implying here that they are agreeing to the fact that Jesus Christ is Messiah, that he is the Son of God, that this Jesus came in the flesh, which is also implying here that he was the preexistent Son of God. For the Bible says that Christ is come in the flesh. Now we read of this, and most of us, I believe, can in this Sunday night crowd defend that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Where would we go to do that, class? Well, there are many verses. How many of you would say, well, John 1 would be a good place to start, amen? John chapter 1, the doctrine of the deity of Christ. And what does John 1, 1 say? Say it with me. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was? And the Word? Wonderful. But there are those spiritual people who come by carrying books of a religious nature, and they also want to talk to you about Christ, they also will tell you that they believe in Christ. And they will take out their New World Translation. And they will read from their New World Translation, John 1.1, 1, 1, which says in their translation, and the Word was a God. Not the Word was God. The Word was a God. How many of you tonight understand there's a big difference between saying that Jesus, the eternal Word, was God and that he is a God. How many of you can follow me that far? And without going too far into this line, may I simply imply to you that there are alleged translations of the Bible that are derived of evil spirits and the testing would be whether the doctrine is accurate to the teachings that we know to be found in the majority of Scripture. And when we come to a Scripture allegedly saying, or a passage rather, allegedly saying that Jesus was a God, it is a time and an experience where we must try the spirits to see whether they be of God. We must test this doctrinally because there is a big difference between 
God and a God. We find in John chapter 8 and verse 58, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Uh, and yet, when you come to other translations, you'll find uh, different words completely. And again, denying the deity or the pre-existence of Jesus Christ. In fact, in the New World Translation, it says, I was. Quite different from I am. And as you look into these verses, and as you try the spirits, and as you test according to the truth, you begin to find discernment developing. If the spirit has it right about Jesus Christ, then we learn from verse 2 that this is of God. John 16 and 13 says, Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Now, turn there if you would, please. John 16, 13. John 16, 13. Because it is vital in this age, and I believe that there are many people alleging faith in God who will quickly follow the Antichrist one day. I believe that there is much to be said in the ecumenical movement and fringes of the charismatic movement. I believe there is much to be said about the fact that people in this woke age are following their idea of religiosity, but not exclusively following the claims of Jesus Christ. And that some of those religious people that we know will actually be following the Antichrist in the end times. They will love his religious appeal. He will be the most uh, ecumenical religious leader to ever speak on planet Earth. And people that are not given to testing, people that are not determined to test, are not going to have a determination of what is right or a discernment of what is right. Now look at John 16, 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, speaking here of the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. The Holy Spirit can only speak truth, and the Holy Spirit will only exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see here that the way to know if something is of the Holy Spirit is to test it, verse 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Everyone that confesseth Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And we must test spirituality by what does this person believe about the Lord Jesus Christ. May I say to you that probably 99% of the people that speak the news to you on the evening news watch do not confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that that very fact should cause you to be careful with respect to some certain news. There may be some things that are irrelevant in that discussion, perhaps relating some basic fact, although most networks struggle to get a basic fact right. But anything that would pertain to the truth of God's Word is often maligned and twisted by those who deny that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And so we see here concerning discerning the truth that it is to know how uh, through the work of the Holy Spirit and also to discern the spirit that is antichrist. So verse 2 says, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. This is how we know that a teacher is in line with the Holy Spirit. They are teaching the truth about the deity of Christ. Well, how do you know if someone is uh, of a false spirit? How do we understand that area? Verse 3, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. Now, that's a very short and simple phrase. So I want you to read it with me tonight. Verse 3, the first phrase, ready, begin. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh now, Christianity today sometimes struggles to simply say, that teaching is not of God. That denomination is not of God. That faith is not of God. How many of you know it's politically incorrect to say such a thing? But how many of you also know it is disingenuous to imply that a faith group is of God when that group is denying the person and the work of Jesus Christ? It is disingenuous. It is dangerous. The spirit of Antichrist is found in those who
who do not confess that Jesus is Christ. Now, this was very prevalent uh, at the time of the writing of the Apostle John with the group we talked about several weeks ago known as the Gnostics. Gnostic knowledge uh, taught that knowledge itself was one's uh, true spiritual uh, being or entity and that, that matter is evil. They believe that Jesus Christ could not be God because he took the form of a body and therefore he was no way God. This was the teaching that they adhered to. Uh, and so uh, in the Gnostic uh, concern and in their teaching, uh, here John is calling on the believers to say, listen, you need to test the teaching of the Gnostics by what the Word of God says and by how the Spirit would lead you. And the Spirit of God would not uh, allow them to give adherence to a set of, of teaching that denied that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And so here we see in verse number uh, three, every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. The Antichrist uh, will be the Christ of the cults, the Buddha of Buddhism, the Mahdi of Islam, and the seeming Messiah of Israel. And notice what it says here in verse number three. This is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in this world. You see, the Antichrist will say that all religion is good and all the religions need to come together. And we, we somehow just need to gather around the fact that there is a God, uh, the God of Abraham, they may call him at times, the God of the universe, they may refer to. But the fact of the matter is that while they're calling all religions to come together, they are denying that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the only way of salvation. That's the message of ecumenicism on the flip side. You've seen the bumper stickers, coexist. What are they saying? All the religions need to come together and coexist. And fundamental teaching is the problem today. We don't need to be so dogmatic about who Jesus is or what he did. We just need to give equal credence to all religions. May I say to you tonight, that is heresy and that is the message of an evil spirit. The message of the Holy Spirit, as we saw a moment ago in John, is to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit doesn't put Jesus on the same shelf with all of the false religions or religious teachers. The Holy Spirit exalts the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why when you hear somebody maybe on the radio or you visit a church on vacation and they start preaching John 3.16 and they start preaching that we're all sinners but Jesus, the perfect Son of God, shed His blood for our sin and they start exalting Christ, something in you starts getting revved up. Can I get an amen on that? Something in you starts to tingle and something of you says, bless God, I'm away from home, but that man's preaching about my Savior, my Jesus. What's happening at that very moment? The Holy Spirit of God is bearing witness within you that the message of that teacher is the message of truth. And that's why when you hear someone say, hey, we're going to have a religious study together. Now look, we're not going to get too emphatic about anything and don't be a Bible thumper and don't start insisting about Jesus Christ being the only way. That's why when you hear that talk many times, it's deflating within your spirit because your spirit does not bear witness with that philosophy. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. A determination to test will lead to a discernment of truth. Why is discernment so necessary in these days? 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen. 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Now, just pause for a moment. Paul is teaching the Corinthians that there are some evil teachers that are so manipulative and under such demonic power and influence that they can transform themselves into the apostles of Christ. We know of many false religions. Some come directly to my mind who claim to have apostolic powers and succession. And their leaders claim to be authoritative. You say, what's the significance of using the term apostles? Well, we understand that the apostles gave revelatory truth we understand that they were the recipients of divine revelation from the Holy Spirit, that they spoke with authority in the early church. 
And we believe that with the passing of those apostles and the completing of scriptures, we believe tonight as Bible-believing Baptists that the Word of God is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. We're not waiting for some apostle to come along and add to it or subtract from it. Churches that claim apostolic authority today are claiming an authority that is equal to the scriptures. And so here the Bible says that these false apostles and deceitful workers will transform themselves. They'll say that they are in the lineage of the apostles of Christ. And look at verse 14. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. You see, Satan's business is to, to simply transform himself. Ushers, that's the last time I want you to let that young man walk back into this church. You can walk out once, but not four times, and I'd appreciate some help from the ushers on that. Thank you. No marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Now understand something tonight. Satan can be transformed into an angel of light. His ministers can be transformed into an angel of light. What is the Bible telling us? The Bible is telling us that there will be so-called apostles or ministers who are speaking out on the subject of religion or even the subjects of the Bible, but they are not empowered by the Holy Spirit. They are empowered by Satan himself. So how important is it, is it for us tonight to have spiritual discernment in this time? The scriptures are clear that in the latter times we will see many people falling into spiritual deception by satanically inspired teachers or so-called apostles. And so verse 1 gives us a determination to test. God says, I want you to try the spirits. I don't want you to give credence to everything that is given in the name of religious teaching. And then he says, secondly, I want you to discern the truth. I want you uh, to understand that every spirit that confesseth not that Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the cornerstone test of a false spirit or a false church. What do they teach about Jesus Christ? We see a determination to test. And I want to call you to that tonight. I want to tell you that in these upcoming days, that determination to test will be more vital than ever. I will test every religious teaching by the doctrines of the Word of God, the cornerstone doctrine being, who is Jesus Christ? I determine to test. I will discern according to the truth because there are many teachers that confess not that Jesus is the Christ. And then notice, thirdly, there is a divine triumph for all of us. Someone says, well, there's so many evil spirits. The Antichrist is coming and may be alive today. There's so much false teaching. How can I have victory in a day like this? Well, notice if you would, verse 4 as we close tonight. It says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Notice, first of all, we have overcome the spirit of Antichrist. Well, how does that happen? When did that happen? Friend, it happened the day you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. The Spirit of the living God took up residence in you. Romans 9 and verse 7 says, if, if we have not the Spirit of God, we are none of His. And we overcome by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. In fact, notice here in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, we studied this a few weeks ago. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You see, we are born again as the sons and the daughters of God. And oh, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. And so this victory, this overcoming that we know uh, is because of the presence of the Lord himself. We have been born again, therefore we are overcomers. Notice that in verse number four. It says clearly, and have overcome them. And uh, here uh, is an interesting word, Nikeo. It comes from the noun Nike, which means victory. In other words, our victory is linked 
to our relationship with Christ and to the presence of the Holy Spirit of God in our life. And you may feel overwhelmed with all the false teachers and all the narratives and the, the forming of the platform of the Antichrist and all of the globalization that we see all around us. May I remind you tonight that if you are Christ's, if you have put your faith in Christ, you have his spirit living within you and greater is he than is in you than all of the evil spirits put together. The Holy Spirit of God and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ is yours. We were in Ephesus many years ago and, and walked by this goddess uh, of Nike. And uh, this was the ancient goddess Nike uh, emblemizing for them victory. But I got to tell you something. There is no victory in a stone god, but there is victory in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. And so this is the truth of the overcomer and that we have victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have overcome the spirit of Antichrist because we have the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And friend, I want to tell you something. You might, uh, you might wonder about what level of protection you have physically with various types of medicine, but can I give you a guarantee from the Word of God tonight that if you are saved and that if you have the Holy Spirit of God in your life, that greater is He that is in you than he that is in this world? And that's a direct reference to Satan himself, who is the prince and the power of the air. And God has given you all of the ability by his divine presence to discern and to overcome and to have greater power than the wicked spirits of this world. And so we have overcome the Antichrist. And the victory that we have is through the presence of God himself. Notice in verse 4 as we close, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. Oh, thank the Lord for that. Turn, if you would, quickly in the Bible to 1 Corinthians 6, 19. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. This tells us about the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. And as we close tonight, I want you to let this truth hit you anew and afresh. I want you to live this reality this week. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. What are the next three words? Which is in you. Four words. Which is where? The Holy Ghost, which is where? Which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, why do we want to glorify God in our body? Why do we reject uh, the idea of desecrating this temple? Why should we endeavor to be in good health? Why do we resist marking this body or piercing this body? Why do Christians refrain from the actions of the world that would oftentimes desecrate the body? Why do we teach young men to live in dignity as young men? and young ladies to remember their role as a young woman? Why do we teach Christian manhood and Christian womanhood? Why do we do these things? Just to keep up with a list? No. Why do we do it? Verse 20, because we are bought with a price and it is our desire to glorify God in our body. It's not merely our desire to keep a list of rules. It's our desire to glorify God in our body. Can I get an amen on that tonight? It's not about simply pleasing this one or that one. It is about deflecting praise to God. So here we see that our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in us. Friend, tonight, it may be imperative for some in this room to begin anew and afresh getting to know the Holy Spirit. He is the third person of the Godhead. The Spirit of the living God recently Someone was telling me about a song referring to the Holy Ghost as the ghost. Can I tell you something? I would not refer to the Holy Ghost as a ghost. Some contemporary song was trying to link into the Halloween holiday. Number one, I don't want to link into Satan's holiday. Four or five more of you could say amen to that right there. I don't want to give credence to Satan's holiday. But I certainly don't want to try to in a marketing sense, link the Holy Ghost to this holiday of evil ghosts because 
the Holy Ghost has all power over every evil ghost. And I would rather teach the children about the true presence of the Holy Spirit of God in their life. And friends, we need to practice His presence this week. Let the Spirit of God guide your conversation. Let the Spirit of God guide your definitions and directions. Let the Spirit of God move you away from false teaching. And by the way, as we saw earlier, he'll lead you into the truth, you see. In fact, the Spirit of God will always lead you in your body and in your spirit to glorify God and to bring honor to God. John Philip said, the Spirit of God lives in us. He too is God, and Satan is as powerless before the unleashed might of the Spirit of God as he was before the exerted might of the Son of God. We have the same weapon that Jesus had, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Folks, I know there's a myriad of false teachers. I know the spirit of Antichrist is present, but we cannot act like we're some kind of a defeated bunch of Christians just hunkering down waiting for the rapture. We are on the winning side, and the Holy Spirit of God indwells us tonight, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, is in our hands tonight, and the doctrinal truth of Jesus Christ as the Son of God is in our hearts tonight. Therefore, greater is He that is in me than he that is in this world. And church, don't enter this week like, oh boy, I don't know if I can survive another week. Don't get to thinking that the only way to survive is to hunker down, to hide. But my friend, may we enter the battle this week knowing that we have the victory in Jesus Christ. And so, 1 John 4, 1, we must be determined to test religious teachings and teachers by the test of the Spirit and the test of the Scriptures. And as you test, and as you try, and as you examine, and as you, like the Bereans, are noble in this testing process, rightly dividing the word of truth, you will develop a discernment. You will develop a discernment. You say, Pastor, do you feel like you have a measure of discernment? I may or may not. I believe I do. But let me tell you something. I have no corner on the market. You don't have to be a pastor to have discernment. Every parent in this room needs discernment tonight. Sometimes you're going to discern, is that product that my child has purchased, is, that, is the origin of that of God or against God? Amen. Folks, you're going to see it in full display this week. Some of you are going to work with grown adults who are going to dress up provocatively and wickedly and just run around the office with incredible, embarrassing lack of any kind of discernment. You're going to see grown adults acting very strangely this week. And I'm not calling you to bring them into judgment. I'm just simply saying, as a believer, does the Holy Spirit lead you to do that? Or does he call you to bring glory to God? A little hard to bring glory to God when you're dressed up like a skeleton, running around the office place. Friend, whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God. And there's no way to live that way unless you are following the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God in your life. Determined to test, gain a discernment from the truth, and you will experience divine triumph because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Let's stand together tonight. Father, You have told us that we will need the discernment to try the spirits to see whether they be of God. And between now and next Sunday, everyone in this room will have wicked, evil spirits of the religious sort, others of the cultural sort that are distorting truths, denying truths. And so, Lord, would you help us to try the spirits to see whether they be of you? Because we don't celebrate a ghost. We celebrate the presence of the Holy Ghost of God in our lives tonight. And for that we are thankful. 
And so we ask you tonight, Holy Spirit, to guide and direct us into truth and away from error. Heads are bowed tonight. How many would say, Pastor, there is no doubt that I need to try the spirits, that I need to follow that which is of God, and that I need to turn away from that which is clearly anti-Christ. And God is speaking to my heart tonight. Friend, it, it may or it may not be some religious gathering. It may be something you watch on television or listen to in some other form. If the Holy Spirit's convicting you about some error, I want to encourage you to turn from it tonight. How many tonight would say, Pastor, God spoke to my heart tonight. Pray that I'll have the discernment that I need. Would you lift your hand tonight if God spoke to your heart? We need discernment today. We need it desperately. There may be someone here tonight without Christ as your Savior. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, friend, I, I want to encourage you to come and trust Christ. He died for your sin. He is the Son of God. He rose again. This is the truth. And He wants to save your soul if you've never been saved. I pray that you'll let Him do that. Father, we pray tonight that you would bless in this time, in this service, that we would yield to your Holy Ghost, that we would not be gullible, but that we would gain discernment in these last days. And Lord, I pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.